Hello friends, just got back from Southeast Game Exchange and man, I had a great time. I met a lot of cool people, a lot of familiar faces and some new faces, but also I had the amazing privilege of being able to host a panel on Saturday. And that panel was physical versus digital media. How does gaming really fit in? So it was really fun. I took a quite a bit of time to try to prepare for it because I try to get as perfect as I can. But anyways, I want to show you that panel because I was able to record it. And I do want to note that uh, I did edit it just a little bit and not really for content or anything like that. I only edited for the following. I took out some of the beginning that was a little bit slow, um, kind of before the panel as I was setting stuff up. And of course I, I chopped the kind of the end off went before I, uh, I hit the, the stop button on the recording. Um, I also reframed the picture a little bit because it's kind of a wider shot, the greater table. The TV that was in there is kind of small and you probably can't see the contents at all. I know I couldn't. So I went ahead and did a picture by picture format where I put the slides in and you can see the picture of the camera right next to it as well. And because there was a lot of background audio and you can't really hear unedited, you can't really hear the, the audio super great. I tried to boost it a little bit and take some of the background noise out. So really edited it to try to give you the best experience as though you were there or a little bit better than where you're there. So you can actually view it on YouTube and know what I'm talking about and what you're looking at. So uh, that being said, I hope you enjoy and yeah, I hope to go back next year in some capacity. So hope you enjoy and game on. to get started in a couple of minutes. I just want to say thank you all for being here. Really, this is this is amazing. My first, my first panel at one of these conventions and y'all showed up, thank you. But um, I do, I didn't anticipate the screen being kind of a little bit small, so I do have some stuff on it I'll be referring to during the session. So if you do want to get up as close as you can next fall, I do also have some physical things to kind of illustrate as we're talking, um, but we'll get into that in a second. So, Probably a couple minutes and we're good to go. Yeah, lots of good. Alright. Hello everybody. How are y'all doing? Y'all y'all having a good time today? Staying cool? No. No? Okay. Well we're in the same boat then. So. Uh, again, welcome to today's panel or the con console mascots in the satanic panic of the 1980s. Conspiracy or coincidence? Oh. You're in the right panel, right? I'm just kidding. Today's panel, physical versus digital media. How does gaming really fit in? I do want to throw it out there because we all have, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a convention of physical stuff, physical items. A lot of us use digital stuff. We all have opinions about a lot of stuff. This is pretty much going to be my uh, my opinion, my take, my view on the subject. Also, I'm not a legal expert, so if I get something wrong, please let me know. <laughs> um, if you have, of course, if you have different opinions, you know, I'd love to talk about it after the uh, the panel. But uh, thank you again for listening to me rant as we go through the next hour or so. But before we do that, I'll give you a quick introduction about um, a little bit about myself, just to kind of give you my perspective uh, about the subject. So that being said, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, um, played outside all the time, you know, did standard stuff as, as a kid. Uh, you know, I was fortunate to have access to some really cool computers. Um, my dad worked at IBM, so I got to go and see you know, supercomputers, mainframe, things like that. Uh, big Radio Shack fan as well, so a lot of uh, you know Tandy and those types of things in the house. Um, but ultimately, with you know, I'm I'm really I love experiences. I love good stories. I love things that make you really feel something. You know, like really good art. So naturally, I I grew up loving video games and things like movies and TVs. Uh, TV TV shows and things like that. 
Um, but I also love to learn from things that come before me. And of, of course, if you're a little younger, um, this is probably why you're here as well. You're learning a little bit about some of the, the history of physical gaming, and you're seeing history right here. There's a ton of history that I've never seen out on the floor here, and it's, it's amazing that we can share that all together, right? So that being said, I ended up going into art, did that little bit of freelance, and then I went into IT, and I ended up running a game store in the late 2000s, about 2008 or so, was a retro game store. I'm a big Sega fan. Who's a big Sega fan? Anybody in the yeah. Sega? Also yeah. grew up with Atari as well. So Atari and Sega, those were my two big passions. Um, and I kept collecting. I started my collection, again, about, the same, about 2000, 2001. So being a Sega fan, that was a really great time to start collecting. Things were cheap. People were throwing that stuff away pretty much. And then eventually I started um, I wanted to kind of share my own opinions and my own view, and I started a little, little small YouTube channel, so um, about 500 subscribers or so, no big deal. Um, but again, my, my, my goal is to really just, um, you know, talk about my experiences, share my passion, you know, for, for video games and media of all types. So I do also want to say full disclosure, again, we're into gaming, so I love to do full disclosure and be honest with you all. I was at Microsoft for about 10 years. I was not into the, I wasn't in Xbox or anything like that. I was more in the retail side and small medium business, that type of thing. But I got really exposed to some of the, um, at that time, again, that was about 15 years ago. So about five years ago, um, I got exposed to some of the cutting edge as physical media was kind of turning more digital. People were consuming more digital games, digital TV, um, you know, 360 Connect, that type of stuff, trying to, to, to bridge that gap when people were really being exposed to the, the digital licensing, you know, going away from physical, right? So, um, that being said, that's a little bit of my background. And when we talk about physical versus digital media, I really want to just define it, right? Because media is a huge general subject. When we talk about media, we're talking about content, information produced or packaged for enjoyment or learning. That's what we're going to be talking about. And physical media specifically, and I wrote it down, I'm going to be referring to it, uh, analog and digital data storage mediums manufactured for consumption comes in a tangible, usually individually sold. So a physical thing that you can pick up, put in, play, or read. So anything you see up here, you know, books, uh, guides, things like that. So that's that's physical media, um, tapes, things like that. Laser disc, big laser disc man. Um, digital media is something specifically that's downloaded or streamed versions of data stored permanently or temporarily on a hard drive, uh, often distributed in an app or a central platform. So things like you know streaming services, digital downloads for games when you go on PlayStation Network and download a game. That's a digital media. E-readers for uh, e-books. That's a digital e-book. Streaming services for music and video and even, you know, like guidebooks like that that you can't really buy physically too much anymore. Um, so really, when we talk about gaming and media, how does gaming really fit in that? Because gaming is kind of like a, a small pocket of the overall digital and physical landscape. So when we're talking about that, I want to take us back in time. We're going to take a trip back to 1994. Does anybody want to go back to 1984 right now? With yes. me? Yeah? Let's go back. Let's jump in the time portal and bring us back to 1994 to explore what that really looked like. So we're going back in. Thank you for joining me today with that. So, all right, we're back in 1994. You wake up, it's a Saturday morning. You go down, get some cereal. You want to watch a cartoon? What do you do when you want to watch a cartoon? You turn on the TV, you see what's on, right? <laughs> you open up the TV guide maybe, see what's coming up next. Um, I know I had a, an antenna on the house, so that's kind of, we had maybe like five, four or five channels, whatever was in range. Um, if you had cable back then, of course you had, you know, Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, a few other choices that you could turn on to watch cartoons. Um, some, of, some of my favorites, uh, Reboot and Sonic, of course. A Sega fan, of course, Animaniacs, Doug, things like that. So you got to watch, you know, that was how you got TV, right? And then, 
you know, again, it's 1994, so we're talking, this is like peak physical media period, right? So you either got something physical in the TV there, or if you want to watch cartoon, you've got the tapes on your tape right there. Uh, if you want to watch either, you know, a movie, what did you do, right? Pay-per-view was obviously a thing. Uh, if you had a VHS, you had a, a tape player, you popped in a VHS. Well, Betamax. Betamax, oh. yeah, beta tape, yeah, absolutely. Laserdisc again, if you if you had some money and you want to throw $50 at a Laserdisc, you, have a, you, you bought Laserdisc. Or, of course, you know, what were your other options? You, you know, maybe you beg your parents to go to the local rental store, a Blockbuster, and, you know, whatever they had, you know, you would... <laughs> Maybe the, the news movie wasn't, uh, they had five copies, and it was all out before you got there, right? Um, or you could go to the movie theater, right? So how did you find out what movies you were available, right? Yellow pages, right? Either yellow pages, you call them up, newspaper, you'd open up the newspaper and see what the times were, physical, or physical newspaper, you can go online. Um, and then if you want to listen to music, what options did you have? Turn on the radio. Um, usually AM, FM radio, uh, cassette tapes, eight CDs, track. eight track. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the most popular probably uh, cassette and CD, of course. <laughs> I didn't get a CD until probably '99, ish myself. But, um, and of course, well, you know, you're a kid in the '90s, and you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta do homework, right? Oh man, man. it's uh, <laughs> so. How did you, how did you research your papers and stuff, right? If you want to research your paper, well. Maybe you had an encyclopedia stack. You know, you look up encyclopedias. Uh, you'd ask, ask the teacher for more references. Uh, you go to the library uh, and, and use the Dewey Decimal System to look up the resources that they had. Um, and was that anybody here use Dewey Decimal? Card catalog system, the library. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, you can also watch TV as well. Some, you know, PBS uh, was was very popular. Uh, you know, they had Beacon's World, which was one that was at that time. But Bill Nye, Mr. Wizard, was probably ending his, I think, run that before that and had some reruns. But there was also starting to be more digital formats, still physical, but you had like um, uh, Encarta 95 and, you know, let me see, I think I have that right here. So you have a physical, you know, you don't have to go out and buy big books. Now you have an encyclopedia, multi multimedia with sounds and video on a disc. You couldn't download it. <laughs> we had it on the disc, and they were priced for that. You know, hundred bucks, and you got an encyclopedia. That was a bargain. Um, but that was starting to transform. Physical, still physical, but starting to bridge the gap to digital a little bit. So, again, what was the state of the internet in 1994? Anybody use the internet in 1994 here? Raise your hand. All right. So you were one of very few because in 1994, 623 web servers existed. 1994. That's it. You had bulletin board systems where you dial into somebody else's computer locally to get information, play games, things like that. But by the end of the year, that was a huge explosion for the internet. 10,000 servers were available at the end of the year. So 1994 was a huge jump for everybody who had computers. Go to library and access a computer. Pages like Yahoo, the White House website, uh, Snopes, Con you know, Library of Congress, that all started in 1994. So started to really see that, but people weren't really convinced as much about this digital future. So our day-to-day -day life was physical media. All right, let's get to the gaming. So gaming, yes, uh, how's that fit in? Uh, so we were firmly in the physical media era. So you went out you rented a game, same thing with movies. You'd rent a game, you'd go out and buy a game, you'd get a magazine to find out what games were coming out and the prices. Some of the prices you can't see here, but some of them were a little bit, you know, it was a 50, $60, $70 games. Some of them were, were 80, 90, depending on what game you would get, um, and accessories like that. So you had um, Japan, Sega Saturn was out at the end of the year, Sega Genesis, Sega CD. 32X, which is one of my personal favorites, actually. I got that, I think, in 95, but that came out at the end of the year. Super Nintendo, Turbo Graphics, Atari, Jaguar, 3DO, all big and all physical media. You had to buy a disc, you had to rent a disc, had to get a cartridge, things like that. Um, that was firmly in there. But also, if you wanted to play games, too, other than getting some on the PC, 
which you could get shareware. Does anybody know about shareware for PC? Basically, glorified game demos. They entice you to, to, to play and buy the original games. So you could go and get some like Blake, Blake Stone, a really good shooter at that time. Um, and we used to go out and either get them through mail order, we would have to call somebody, send in something, go out to, um, go out to, what was it, a PC warehouse basically, whereas the computer shows were a bunch of vendors kind of like this, every couple weekends would show up. Mm -hmm. What about if uh, just turning it onto a floppy disk? You could, yeah. You could take shareware or obviously fully registered versions to do that. Copy it on, don't copy that floppy though. Don't copy that floppy. Um, hey, there's no other way to get it uh, these days. But yeah, you would have to go out and get the shareware disks. Usually you'd pay a little bit and you'd get it. And you try it and maybe you'd buy the real game, right? But of course you had arcades and I'm super happy to see the arcade setup. Go check it out. Some of the great uh, arcade games are back there as well, but that was how you, you know, typically play games like that back then. So to get into physical and licensing, so ever since physical games came out, there were pretty much, you had to follow the set of rules in order to play the game, of course. So um, media licensing basically was kind of like when you see the FBI warning the beginning of a, of a movie, something like that, don't copy under penalty of law, things like that. Technically, everything you buy, whether it's a game now or back then, you basically agree to a license. And when you buy the when you buy the game, you're not buying a copy of the game. You're basically buying a license to play that game within the specified confinements of that game. So basically, if you bought a Sega CD 32X game you're allowed to play this game on a Sega CD32X. Pretty much, that's that's how you bought it. Same thing for, you know, Super Nintendo game, you rented it, you bought it. Um, you don't buy a copy, you basically bought a license. And that's kind of important to know and to point out because when we talk about, eventually in a minute, about digital transformation, going into the digital realm, it's pretty much the same concept. So obviously it's a lot easier, you get a bit more control when you buy a physical copy of a game of what you can do with it. They can't take away that that, that copy of a game, right? Right? At least not then. <laughs> um, but to control the license on the media, essentially, copy protection was integrated and implemented from probably, the, I think, the late 70s, early 80s on these games. So what did that look like? So there were different forms of copy protection. You'd have things like, oh man, this is actually my original copy of Zany Golf. I don't know, has anybody played this back on IBM DC uh, or Tandy? Uh, it works if you have 380, 384K of RAM. Um, but with that, you get something like, like a decoder wheel. So if you didn't have this and your friend copied the game for you, you go to start the game, it'll say, okay, cool. What's uh, what's the, the number under Castle uh, 3 work? You line it up, you put in a number, you get to play the game. If you didn't have that, you couldn't play the game. So people obviously would, would, would take these apart and copy them, photocopy them and put them together. But that was kind of the beginning of copy protection. Sometimes there would be, um, on the discs themselves, they would be formatted a certain way that was a little bit harder to, to, to um, copy. But also, in the middle there, you can kind of see the claw marks. Hey, by a Wing Commander fan. I'm a big Wing Commander fan. Um, basically, they gave you the, the um, in-universe magazine, you know, news newsletter, newspaper. And when you start the game, it'll say, okay, turn to page three, read paragraph, you know, four. What's what's that word in there? And it's, that's that form of copy protection. Is you had to have a copy of it. And if you lost it, um, that was it. You had to buy another copy. I would definitely buy another copy of Wing Commander game, honestly, I love it. <laughs> um, but that being said, uh, yeah, it's, there were, there's always ways to overcome the copy protection, but that was one way that production companies and developers could basically make it so that they can protect how, uh, how you play the game, so if you're playing legally. Um, but of course, you know, back then there wasn't really as much thought about preservation of media, it was more just preserving their wallets, right? Making sure they get as much money from uh, selling these games. So 
That being said, of course, you had things like shareware, like we mentioned, that were distributed in magazines. Sometimes if you were using, like let's say, Commodore 64, they would give you the, the code in the magazine and type it in yourself uh, for that version. Um, you go to places like Blockbuster, you could even rent the consoles themselves to play it as well. Different ways to get you to, to try the game um, before you, you, um, you went in and actually bought it. But that being said, uh, again, you know, it's it, it's it's been a long time since that was kind of the standard because we're going to go ahead and go back through the time portal, jump ahead to 2004. So only 10 years, right? Um, but does anybody know what, what game that is, by the way? Unreal Tarot 2004. Yeah, we got 04. We got it. Perfect. <laughs> One of my favorite games. <laughs> That being said, let's talk about 2004. It was only 10 years later, right? If you wanted to watch TV, same thing. You uh, you now had satellite TV, which is, again, a very, very similar experience to cable. Sometimes it go out during a snowstorm, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, movie theaters, if you want to watch TV. You did have DVD now, which, again, was actually uh, really good for pirates in a way because the quality was a bit better it's easier to copy and distribute back in 1994 even this time if you wanted to get a um a vhs dupe of a, a of a movie there was a lot of pirates you can actually some of i went to a local mall and they actually had a guy that had like 20 different tape players hooked up to one and was just copying movies so um dvds were a little bit better but the dvd media itself was in um was actually a little bit harder to, to, to break at first, but now it's kind of easier. Go ahead. Uh, Sonic Rush came out in 2005. Yep. But DS, the, the more illustration, the DS was out at that time, so thank you for pointing that out. That's actually, I put it up because I'm a big Sonic fan, so <laughs> I kind of overlooked that, but thank you. <laughs> um, but also, that being said, what's really important at this time, we spoke about the internet was kind of starting to boom, in two, uh, 1994, a little bit, but in 2004, um, you finally you started hitting the 50% mark, where you have 50% of America using dial-up and 50% using broadband, which is high-speed internet. At, at this time, not as high speed, but um, you're starting to get that, where now companies are starting to look into ways of distributing and you know pushing out media through the internet. And I kind of put in a couple things there. You know, a lot of us had MySpace at that time, using AOL Instant Messenger to talk to each other, or IRC, um, and putting up their art on places like LiveJournal or DeviantArt. So you're starting to see the shift to digital media at that time. People that didn't actually print out their, their pictures, and now it's going into the digital format. And there weren't as a lot of, a lot, a lot of rules for distribution at that time. At that time, for um, for gaming, basically, you had, you know, it's, again, 2004, Dreamcast. St I'm still playing it, but it's it's gone. Um, Xbox, PS2, GameCube, DS, kind of big ones at that time. But uh, with 2002, a little bit earlier, you had uh, you had Xbox and you had Xbox Live Arcade. So I want to point out Xbox Live Arcade was one of the mechanisms that did change gaming forever in kind of the way that the mechanism for gaming was marketed. So because, again, half of Americans had brought in, you had experiences coming out like Xbox Live Arcade and Xbox Live so that you can have these online experiences, these seamless experiences. You don't have to you know, buy a game and sit in a room with a bunch of people anymore. You can play them online together. And what was big with this is DLC was, was starting to become a normalized thing. So DLC, you know, United Friends list. So that's, you know, Xbox Live having a United platform to connect people with voice communication or not was a big, big game changer in the slow, relatively slow, but at this point kind of fast shift to digital gaming. And how did you get into that? You'd either uh, call in and mail order again, uh, or you could get uh, Xbox Live Disc uh, in a magazine, and you can also download demos for games. No longer did you have to go somewhere to uh, to get a demo 
or something, you can actually get that from Xbox Live. So the licensing for the demo is now digital. It's all completely digital and tied to Xbox Live and the Xbox Network. We go to PC game. How many people are PC gamers? Woo! All right, PC gamers represent. Um, I was, yeah, I grew up with PC gaming. I was big in PC gaming. Steam changed PC gaming forever, in my opinion. I mean, there's there's a lot of different smaller versions and, and companies that have come and gone and whatnot, but um, my first big um, experience with digital distribution, because I didn't have an Xbox at that time, um, was with PC. Half-Life 2 was a huge influence. I remember pre-ordering it from Babbage's and getting the big box copy and everything like that. But when I put the disc in, it, I was greeted with a Steam installer. And, I'm like, <laughs> and I have dial-up. Right. But the good thing is the game files were on the disc, so it would, it would install the game from the disc. But that was one of the first PC games well, not, it wasn't the first, but it was one of the first games to require Steam, which is a huge catalyst for people jumping on Steam. People like me love Half-Life, and I wanted to buy, half, play, buy and play Half-Life 2, so I had to have Steam. I had to make an account, and that code that came with the Half-Life 2 game disc was tied to my account. Now, that was just, that's how they, they tie the license. That's how they control the license. It's no longer tied to disc, and I no longer had control of... Um, what I would do if I, you know, I, if I lost the disc today, which I still have it actually, if I lost the disc, as long as I have access to my account, I can still play it because that's the terms of the license. But again, Valve knew that they put that killer app on that platform and skyrocketed usage of Steam. Um, and honestly, what did I think about that? Um, person, I hated it. <laughs> I thought at, at the beginning, I thought Steam was very slow. And again, I was on 56K, but slow, buggy, crashed a lot. Um, the forced updates on games when I wanted to play a game, and then, you know, it had to update first. Please, no. <laughs> so this is what we got to look forward to. Um, and uh, obviously it got better. You know, pretty much everybody uses Steam. But... Especially if you're working save files. Yes, okay. yep, yep. Save files and everything, exactly. Go ahead. The crazy thing about this, because Valve discontinued support for Steam on XP through 8.1, you can't even play Half-Life 2 through the disc anymore, officially at least. You are 100% right. And that's oh, something that we're, you know, we're talking about in here is, you know, about copy protection, about controlling the license, you know, you had a few different versions. Steam was kind of the way of controlling license. You also had Save Disk, which is also just basically, hey, did you have the original game just popped in the, in the computer? Um, no server was needed for that. Uh, but then you have, you know, things like uh, server connection to kind of verify that you, you own the game, it's, you own the, the software, it's legitimate. And then, um, you know, that's completely pretty much out of your control because then we're introduced to something called Securum. Um, which is great for publishers to be able to control, again, control the legality, because they're, they're trying to prevent piracy. They're trying to prevent people from, um, you know, illegally copying their media, because it is a bit easier than ever to do that with the internet distributing media and whatnot. So they, they kind of went a little bit harder and on the controls with secular language. There is a lot of victims for that, especially, we're looking at 2004 and kind of the, the mid, late 2000s, you're looking at things like that where you buy a game and then it's like all right well is it tied to an account is it tied to a server that doesn't exist anymore to activate the game so people who, who legally bought a game that want to play it without any mods or anything like that what it, what are you to do so that being said since about 2015 or so games protected the Securom. Um, they, they no longer work pretty much on their original intended hardware. Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, um, because of operating system updates, Securom like servers, stuff like that. Um, and the only way to really bypass it is to pretty much get cracks and patches and stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah, licensing has become a bit more complicated on the consumer side, but also on the publisher side because they want to protect the licenses that, that, that they provide because essentially they have the license stuff too. They have 
uh, a name actor, they have voice actors, they gotta protect their licenses. Um, so the more complicated it gets and the more expensive, the more money they put into it, the more money they're gonna put into controlling licenses. So um, yeah, so at that time, it can, it, it really prevents backwards compatibility going forward, so um, yeah. And we're also talking about things like, you know, games, games for Windows Live, which again, it's, it was kind of popular at that time, but uh, like Fallout 3, the original release for that was tied to that in the activation server. Um, so even, even when Sekiram was active as a, a thing, Part of the problem was not all hardware, mm -hmm. off-the-shelf hardware, functioned with it at all. So you could yeah. go, go buy a game that had Sekirov, and it just would not work with your hardware. Yeah, and like you said, uh, yeah. you know, at the time, not all hardware actually worked, yeah. you know, well. And that was the thing too is, um, you know, sometimes it would be bloated on your computer. It wouldn't, you know, make your the rest of your computer run slow. Yeah. If you had a, a, an antivirus program that it didn't like, you know, things like that, then it would it would think that you're pirating it. Um, but don't worry, um, they were just pioneering the DRM and perfecting it before like the next generation, PS3, 360 era of games. So thanks for spending a little bit of time in 2004. We're going to come back to the present day where it's it's nice and warm today. So um, day in the life 2024. So we already talked a little bit about 1994, firmly in the physical media. We had a bit more control, but now you know, internet speed, pretty much not a problem for most people. Either connected with your smartphone, 4G, 5G, you got IoT devices, internet of things devices, speakers, cameras, everything's pretty much, you know, your refrigerator is now internet connected. So it's, you know, it's not a problem anymore. That e-commerce is pretty much the standard now, as you all know, we kind of looking at it through a historical lens and, and how, hands-on and you know, physical things were you know a few years ago now we're looking at you know to get food you go through an app um subscription services you know to, to buy pretty much anything to get access to software to get access to games if you want to read a book you get an ebook amazon things like that um online market marketplaces for pretty much anything you order something comes from online so it's not a bad thing i'm just gonna throw out it's just different than what it was before. Um, so if you wanted to watch TV now, I mean, cable still exists, right? But generally, if you want to watch that Saturday morning cartoon, you probably stream it, um, use an app, and you know, you can still, I have to put a point out there, um, digital over the air TV is actually pretty good right now. And if you want to get free, free TV with the cost of an antenna, definitely recommend it because there's a lot of cool, um, you know, high definition over the air TV channels. So. You can still do that, but um, that's definitely not the norm right now. So if you wanted to watch a movie or TV, you have to stream it. Movie theaters exist. I personally love going to them. We have a, a, an Alamo draft house near us, oh, relatively. Yes. So, love Alamo so draft we love house. it, even though um, they were bought out by Sony Pictures, I think, a couple months ago, um, which is okay. Um, but yeah, digital rentals, you can buy discs on Amazon, uh, rest in peace digital and Best Buy, or uh, physical and Best Buy. Uh, <laughs> places like Walmart are scaling it down. If you want to play a game, which we're all here for, you buy it digitally and you download the game, or you get the game on a disc still, and then you download patches, um, day one releases, things like that, day one. Um, PC gaming is pretty much all digital at this point. We're gonna get into that in a minute. Uh, but you have Steam, Epic, GOG, Galaxy, Ubisoft Connect, Battle.net, EA Launcher. You have a lot of that stuff, but uh, physical is all the dead on PC sphere, uh, except for indie stuff, which back then, right? Um, but yeah, anything that can be collected, monetized, and distributed relies around some kind of account on a digital platform, even free services, even free stuff, so that they can take the data and either sell it uh, or monetize it somehow, um, because it's easy to do that. But when it comes to console games, every major console maker has their own digital platform. As you all know, you can buy games, you can subscribe to you know, Nintendo Online Expansion Pack. I love it, actually, I really do love it. Um, many of the digital platforms you can actually buy you know, keys for, 
uh, Humble Bundle, things like that here on PC. But modern media licensing and copy protection. So we already covered a little bit about that, but how has it changed? It's, it's kind of become a bit more complex, um, but essentially most stuff anymore, you've got to be, it's required to be online. Even though we are all online at this time, most of these subscription services and digital services, even if you buy a game for your console, most of them you have to be online for. Switch is kind of a, you know, is still one of those things that you can, you can pop the cartridge in and then play it right off the cartridge. Uh, but that's because the license is contained in the cartridge, right? Um, but why, you know, why this happened? People, a lot of the, uh, the publishers kind of blamed piracy on it, um, but also because people loved the, uh, most people, including myself, we loved the convenience. We loved to be able to, to get right in and play it, download it, pal uh, get patches, um, gameplay editions, season passes, loot boxes, and other pure profit models, um, so things like that. So you have some, some newer licensing things, uh, 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 methods since 1994 and then 2004. So instead of just paying a flat fee, you also have subscription models like we were saying uh, before. You can also get a one-time fee, but also there's a bunch of in-app stuff you can download, like horse armor or <laughs> loot boxes or things like that. Or what's really common, free to play. You sign up, download the game, but there's either some kind of incentive to buy uh, microtransactions or things to continue building your castle or your squad or something like that. Um, so things you can't usually do under the license, copying the media to just redistribute it, modifying it, or resell it. That's kind of, even even going back, a lot of the, the terms and conditions, if you read it, is, you know, you can't modify or, or resell it, which is, which is fun. Um, but that's, that's kind of the shift from physical to digital. It's a lot harder to resell it. You can't really, you'd have to resell accounts, which under terms and conditions is usually not allowed when you get people banned. So it's a lot easier when you have the control of physical media in your hand um, to be able to resell to control the media. That was funny, I actually held up Doom because that was actually the last new PC game that I bought, Doom 2016, um, because I popped the disc in and all I had was a Steam installer on it. That was the only file I didn't have any game media. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the digital license is getting out of your hands currently. So server-based DRM is everywhere now. And honestly, why is this bad? If the server goes away, you can't play your game, even if it's a single player game, right? That's kind of, kind of not good. And we're starting to see more and more um, examples of that. Um, and we, we, we spoke before about Half-Life 2, you, can, you know, the, the hardware is too old. You can't play Half-Life 2 on the original intended hardware, like Windows XP or Windows Vista, things like that. Uh, at least not easily. There's ways to kind of emulate a Steam server so you can install it and stuff like that, but it's, it's kind of crazy. GOG or GOG, yes. they Ooh. do theirs DRM free and you can actually download a copy that we run separate from the server. Yes. Half-Life 2 is one of them. Absolutely. So, yeah. GOG or GOG games. Yeah, they usually have prices. Yeah, so, exactly. So, you're right. That is a, 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 legit, a legitimate way without pirating or anything like that to buy and be able to play um, on modern consoles. Don't figure out what happens to your games after you die if you get the digital copy. The Steam has said, nah, you can't do it. But GOG has said you can pass your account on if you prove it. Yep. So yeah, licensing <laughs> licensing can be very complicated depending on who's controlling the licensing. Whether it's Steam, whether it's GOG, um, whether it's Nintendo, whether it's Microsoft, Sony. So they they set the terms and conditions for that, and you're a lot less able to kind of set your own terms and conditions, right? Um, so entire games can disappear if they were digitally only distributed. And we're seeing that with you know Netflix shows and TV and movies and things like that. Media that is digital that only existed in a digital format, maybe not on Blu-ray or maybe not on DVD. If they decide to not host that anymore, it's gone. Unless you're a pirate, right? Unless you, you make your own copy, which is not under the terms of licensing, right? Um, so this transformation, this server-based transformation affects PC games from the past 20 years, pretty much. So start start thinking about that. Games that existed in you know, 20 years ago to now, 
you're starting to see the effects of servers going away. Um, console games, I'd say probably 15 years or so. It's it's a little bit hairy because console game uh, game companies were kind of a little bit slower to to really mandate digital licensing and controlling the copies of the game you have. Um, but that being said, yeah, again, license ex expiration. People are losing access. We're seeing so many examples on the news recently. Um, you know, Wii U, Nintendo uh, 3DS eShop discontinuation. You can't even buy certain games in legally. They, they don't even offer them for sale. Xbox 360 store. It's closing. It's closing. I don't even know. It's, it's, it's this month. Why so? <laughs> End of this month. So uh, there's digital only licenses of games that are going away. And that's that's kind of, that's bad for, for preservation, it really is. Um, you know, and again, uh, I actually have a little screenshot there. Next month, oh, next month. Uh, Sony will remove hundreds of purchased movies and shows from users' libraries. So even if you bought stuff at one point, because their license expired, they no longer have the ability to give you the content that you paid for. So you lose access to it. Something that I wouldn't have thought of in 1994. You know, it's crazy. But the convenience factor, obviously, is, is, is a good factor. But there's always a, a downside, right? Um, but that being said, DRM has clearly taken control of purchase licenses away from consumers like us. And the argument to why has largely been because of piracy, because digital makes it easier to pirate. Uh, piracy affects all kinds of media and branded products from one way to another, whether it's ebooks. Movies, again, like we said, um, my views on piracy and DRM kind of aligned with Gabe Newell. And you all know him from a uh, Valve theme. Uh, he was famous in saying, oh man, 13 years ago? One thing that we've learned is that piracy is not a pricing issue, it's a service issue. The easiest way to stop piracy is not by putting anti piracy technology to work by giving those people a service that's better than what they're receiving from pirates. So, that being said, I agree with him on that, that it's piracy is a result of access to content and not because we're all evil, right? <laughs> we all want to steal stuff. It's because we can't access it. So, um, so yeah, with that, again, major shift. We're starting to see retailers not stock this stuff anymore. And digital distribution is getting heavy. Since the late 2000s, digital distribution has flipped. It used to be 20% of people bought digitally. Now it's like 83% of people buying content, gaming content, digitally. 1% of PC users are buying boxed. 99% are buying digitally. 83% currently, as of last year, of the console market are buying digitally. That's that's their consumer base. That's who they're making content for right now. And that being said, you know, how could this change so much? Internet shift from physical to digital renting is a lot more convenient. People like to have stuff on their on their phone for convenience on the go. And that's kind of the default anymore. If you grew up with this, that's your default. Physical media is more inconvenient. That big red part on the bottom there, 50% of the game market is mobile. That's why they're making Diablo 4 mobile. They're making, you know, Nintendo's putting Mario, and, you know, there's a lot of Sonic games on mobile. So that's the market share. They're looking for people that are making games are looking at that and saying, what's the market? Mobile, digital. So. My pros and cons to all this, and I'll kind of speed through that because we've really, it's more of a recap. I'm gonna go through that, but before we do that, go ahead and like, subscribe, ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I love physical media. Generally, easy to control. Uh, you can generally use offline unless you can't because of licensing. It's tradable, sellable. Um, I love the pack in gifts and maps and stuff like that. And it's a nice library piece. I love a good physical library. Things I don't kind of like about physical media, admittedly, finite supply. It's harder to find certain games still, you know, if they're not made available. You know, sometimes you can only find them at places like this. It can get really expensive, <laughs> especially if it's uh, something that's not discounted. Um, and again, you know, storage space. 
and plus a lot of new physical games, you just you still don't have that control because of, of the digital licensing. And the whole game is not on the disc. So things that I like about digital media, unlimited supply. If it's available, you can get it. Easy, right? Um, there's a lot of newer types of games like VR experiences and social interactions that are really great and exist pretty much because the internet is there and games as a service, live service games is a thing. So I think that's there's a lot of great innovation, new forms of content, easier to fix games. You're not stuck with a physical game that has a game breaking bug that you find a week later, right? And honestly, indie games, the indie game revolution is because of the internet and distribution services. I generally believe in that. Not so great parts of digital media. You're not in control of your license, when, where you can play it. Um, the incentive to make games is more tied to the profitability of these services. If you know certain studios, uh, they could have acclaimed games and still be uh, you know, kicked out. But there's hope. Vinyl is up. Vinyl sales for music is up. Um, there's a lot of negative press coming out, so the, the, the negative side is being highlighted more. But we got to look at preservation is, and not just backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility is kind of being able to play original license on newer hardware. Preservation is keeping the original as it is or able to be played in its original form. If you think of like Star Wars, the movie, there's a bunch of different versions out. Preserving all those versions is really important, especially the original one. <laughs> you have a lot of different companies and organizations like Video Game History Foundation, uh, archive.org, which is under um, a lot of pressure to help preserve those experiences and help preserve that media in order for us to enjoy it beyond when it was originally intended and when we're no longer here. There's a lot of great, we talked about activation servers and fan servers, there's a lot of great new servers out there to emulate the old stuff that's no longer, longer here. PlayStation, um, uh, PS Online, Network emulated, Xbox Live Remake, you can play original Xbox games online right now with that, City of Heroes, things like that. And honestly, the, one of the big things to take away from this, money speaks. When we talk about the market, the reason that the, these games are being produced and the experiences are being produced digitally is because that's where the market is. If we continue to back, show our support, we're seeing a bigger and bigger and bigger market for retro gaming than ever. We have accessories, we have um, you know, consoles, we have a lot of emulation projects, optical drive emulators. So when those Saturn you know, disk drives start failing, you can replace it, you can still play in the original hardware. Um, so the more that you know, we, we put our money, we put our community towards this experience, the more money that's going to be put into it, the more companies will be investing in it and providing new games, new experiences, and new um, you know, accessories for the preservation aspect and being able to, to play these original games. So it's kind of a big circle. The more fans that, that, that come out and back it, and even show their support, being at events like this and creating you know, fan art and selling their wares, the more money that gets into that, the more people that will do it, the more stuff that will be around physical media and our fandom of physical media. So my call to action is how do we prevent physical media from disappearing forever? Document your experiences. Start your own YouTube channel if you want one. It's free, right? <laughs> uh, support local and small business. Local gamer communities. Join one if you're not part of the community. Find your passion. Wave that nerd flag really high because that's going to be putting the excitement behind all of this that we're here to support today. And just being here, we're supporting physical media. So I thank you for supporting physical media. Let's, of course, try to weed out some little more negative aspects. Don't engage when it's negative, in my opinion. But do your own research. Don't rely on clickbait. But ultimately, ask yourself, what does gaming mean to me? What is important for me? And how do I want to game? Because there's a lot of good stuff for digital, a lot of good stuff for physical. Do what you love, but I'm going to keep supporting physical. And if you want to, engage, support, uplift everybody, uplift each other, build a stronger community, build physical gaming community, support preservation aspects like Archive and all those other great organizations, and support libraries, please, in my opinion. 
because physical media includes books and book and libraries. My local library has like movies and music and stuff that they allow you to borrow for free. Um, so do that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions as I'm packing up? Uh, I'm just curious, as far as like physical versus digital, like, from the sustainability aspect, environmental sustainability aspect, like, what would you be your thoughts as far as that goes? Environmental sustainability, yeah, that's a huge one. Um, I would say it really, yes, um, recycling, of course, if it's there, you know, you don't want to throw it out. Um, I would say it really comes down to licensing, in my opinion. So, um, supporting companies like GOG. If you want to go uh, digital, which I love GOG because the licensing is more in your own control. You can download the game and then you know move it around however you want, hard drives and you know flash drives, things like that. And you can make your own library. Um, so those that's probably what I would recommend. I, I, that's a great point. Though. With the actual licensing stuff, because like I, I definitely yeah. the convenience and like all that digital is a thing, but I, I'm definitely torn because I work in sustainability, so I'm definitely torn on physical supply chains and things like that where it's like less being shipped around and stuff like that. So they're positive. The licenses and stuff are so much higher lab. Yeah. It's just a, yeah, it's kind of complicated. It is very complicated. Yeah, yeah. Distribution is huge and, and complicated and yeah, I would say that would be my recommendation. And I would say do your own research and then engage. So if you want to pass whatever information you pass along or whatever uh, way you, that you would like to kind of amplify and say, hey, I found a great solution, please. That's what I would recommend. I appreciate your efforts in, in uh, sustainability. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening. To me. Thank you. This has been an amazing experience. Hopefully I'm back next year. But enjoy the show. Enjoy the convention and engage. Let's all go to the Alamo again. Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> 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 <laughs>